Anyway, we've been hinting all through the, the, this morning, you know, that uh, uh, things aren't the way they, they need to be. Uh, we've been, <clears throat> we have been driving down this very bumpy uh, reserve road with all kinds of washboard uh, sections to it and our cars have been falling apart as a consequence and we're not very healthy uh, uh, in Canada and and there is there are many reasons for it many reasons there's uh, 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 attitudes that we've inherited from uh, from previous generations. There are uh, uh, barriers that we've uh, set up to uh, 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 without really checking to uh, checking to see how uh, how they fit into the uh, the big picture that uh, uh, that uh, that we need to recognize as, as, as the direction for us uh, moving forward. <clears throat> so there's a number, it's a very complex picture. But in, in, in right in the middle of that is, is, is one part of that story that I think we need to, we need to be aware of. Uh, we need to know uh, why it, it came about. Uh, we need to know why we continue to maintain it, you know, in Canada. We need to know that, you know. And this is an issue that is not, it's like the treaty was before 1996. Uh, it is not an Indian issue. It's a Canadian issue. And when we move to that place, then we can start rebuilding and uh, resetting you know what our great great grandfathers wanted I think to a certain extent <clears throat> so Indian Act well in 1876 and there is history that predates that where the governments of both the United States and Canada really felt that uh, that uh, <clears throat> these poor Poor savages needed to be controlled. They needed to be guided. They needed to be changed. They needed to be um, made into nice little, uh, nice little peasants from uh, from England or Ireland or France or where, wherever. Sort of a rough description of the mentality I think that uh, I was. Uh, permeating through uh, the decision makers of our country. <clears throat> there are some bright spots in, in the midst of that story. Uh, there are uh, the, the uh, moments like uh, the declaration that was signed in 1763 or 43, I can't remember the exact dates, I'm no good with dates. Uh, but it's a, um, it's a declaration that uh, established and is now Kind of the, the 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 most quoted piece of historical uh, decision making uh, around sovereignty that uh, <clears throat> that uh, it established a process where um, the British Crown directed its uh, its people in on this land that they could not unilaterally decide to take indigenous land without first dealing with the the occupants of that of that land it sort of set the uh, set the uh, uh, the mo in motion developments that led to the tr uh, the need uh, for a treaty signing that followed in the next uh, two two hundred years but in eighteen seventy six the, the the ink wasn't dry yet on the on the treaty on Treaty Six uh, from Fort Carlton and Fort Pitt uh, in Ottawa. Uh, Macdonald and his government were busy passing a law called the Indian Act, and that has been part of our life ever since. Today, it's still there today. It's going to be there for more years to come 
Uh, the unfortunate part to this whole story is that the Indian Act is completely contrary to the spirit of, of the treaties that are being signed. We'll talk about spirit and intent and, and, and uh, that, that whole area. Uh, the Indian Act is a piece of legislation that completely undermines the, the spirit uh, of these treaties, completely undermines it. <coughs> and many of the reasons why we have not been able to progress as quickly as, as, as we could uh, in reconciling, you know, our, uh, uh, our way forward to, uh, uh, to the uh, treaty foundation that is uh, a part of us, uh, us when I mean all of us, uh, is that Indian Act. And so, <clears throat> what is the Indian Act? I don't know how many of you are familiar with, uh, with uh, what, it, what it represents. Uh, I'll give you some examples of where the Indian Act has really a huge impact on who we are as, as people. And in many respects, um, what negative impact it has in indigenous communities becomes a negative impact for all of society in Canada. It, it's, it's not a one-sided a one -sided, uh, effect. It's a total effect on, on Canada as a nation. The one, the one area that um, um, really is, uh, uh, needs a lot of work and understanding is the whole area of membership. Membership. Uh, we are the only people, we are the only people in uh, Canada that the federal government decides who we are. They decide who we are and where we belong. And it's all in the Indian Act. There is a certain section of the Indian Act. And they, and so they keep a central registry of of all of us across Canada. They keep a, a central registry and they and the way the Indian Act works is that anybody who wants to be recognized as a member of a particular community has to prove that they have some uh, blood connection to that community. And so they go through a process. And then the application goes to Ottawa. Ottawa has these certain policies that it's developed and certain amendments to the Indian Act that they've passed over the last uh, 40 years, uh, even longer than that, because 1951 was a, was a key, key time for membership. Uh, they decide then, and then they notify, they notify the membership clerk in, in our community you can, you can add this person to your list. In some instances, uh, there are some communities that have what they call a membership code. And so that code then uh, allows that community to, through, uh, through its own process, to recognize uh, those members and then feed back to the central office uh, the, uh, their acceptance of, uh, of, uh, of that particular application. That's an example of how the Indian Act really does control uh, uh, the population, the indigenous population of this country, or tries to. <clears throat> the uh, The part that uh, we have to deal with here in this part, uh, in that part, like for instance in the membership that I'm talking about, the part that we have to deal with here is we have to take, we have to take so many steps backwards. And um, it, like in our case in Muskeg Lake, what are we doing, you know, to, uh, to address this question of membership? 
we're, we're involved in a number of projects in the last uh, last few years. One is we're doing uh, we're doing a fair amount of uh, genealogical research in our own community because I, I mean, one of the side uh, side uh, consequences of the Indian Act has been to s uh, force uh, uh, force forgetfulness of family history. Residential schools are a, a, a very convenient vehicle to do that. Um, but there are there were other measures as well to uh, to break down that uh, historical connection, family historical connection. So we're in our case, uh, the the community people have said we need to know who we're related to. So we're doing that research. Um, the other thing the other thing we're doing is we're. Um, we're investigating Cree law in our community, and it's happening in many other communities. Cree law is, is again an area where uh, where the Indian Act has has uh, virtually uh, replaced many of the laws and the lawmaking processes that uh, that exist uh, historically in our communities. So our process in Muskeg is to is to try to get people like Eva over here. My, my cousin, by the way. <laughs> uh, but her generation, we're, we give them a, a place, a space, where, and, and we, we prod them. Say, we prod them to remember. Because our belief is that every person in our community has memories stored away somewhere in the back, and they haven't. Lived, they haven't acknowledged them, so our prodding is to is to open up some of those uh, some of those little doors and some of those memories to come flowing out, and then we capture them, uh, and we uh, we put them down in writing, and then um, and then we begin to try to reshape what are the laws around membership, what are there are laws around membership. Um, when you uh, when we go back and take a look at um, at uh, the social organization of our of our people, a uh, hundred years ago it was it was the idea of immigration and emigration were part of our lives, an active part of our lives. If a family unit following this chief here and they decides or there is makes a connection with another family and in another grouping it was quite an easy process for that grouping to move over and become part of that new relationship that they've established over here, it could be a marriage. It could be, uh, it could be uh, uh, some kind of an uh, of an alliance or an understanding. Many different reasons why that movement would happen, but that that is part of the immigration um, process that existed among the Crees, and it was very, um, uh, very flexible, very flexible, and so. <clears throat> So we're taking that, we're taking that kind of information and, and trying to establish uh, uh, our own code of how membership needs to be handled. Our, our long-term plan is that, uh, well, it's not that long-term. Uh, next week we're going to meet with uh, people from Ottawa and we're going to say, okay, we want, we want this process back. How do we do it? We'll be polite. Okay, we'll be polite. How do we do it? So we'll start the conversation and see where it takes us. But we need to take, we need to make that part of the Indian Act uh, obsolete. Okay, we need to make it obsolete. Okay, so that's an example of where Indian Act is really um, uh, uh, problematic for for any kind of development, growth, under, uh, identity building uh, among, our, among the uh, uh, people of our communities. 
Um, <clears throat> Another area that uh, uh, the Indian Act really has a large impact is, is the control of land. Really, under the Indian Act, what they have virtually, what the Indian Act does, it takes ownership of the land away from us, and they, they say they hold it in trust for us, mm -hmm. but you don't really own it. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, on the practical side, what it means is that we can virtually do nothing economic on that land without, uh, without uh, uh, the Canadian government being involved. Okay, very difficult. And uh, I, have, I have very concrete experience to, uh, and stories to, to illustrate that difficulty. Because uh, when, when I was chief in Muskeg Lake, we acquired 35 acres in the city of Saskatoon. And it became Muskeg Lake land. The Smagansikana Ski was, oh, it was what we called it. We dedicated it to the veterans uh, of, um, uh, of our armed forces. We very quickly learned how difficult it was for us t to uh, to make it into a viable commercial uh, venture. That was the intent of the purchase of that land. It was intended to be a commercial uh, way for us to be able to build wealth for our community, so that we could eventually, in the long run, become self-sufficient. That was the long-term plan. But the Indian Act had barriers all the way along to prevent that from happening. And one of them was the, the control they had on the land. And so we had to go through many steps more than what a normal person would go through to, a, to let's say, uh, well, even the Oblates wanted to put a, a, a clinic on this property. They'd have to get some, uh, some um, permits and, and do all kinds of uh, research to make sense out of it. But they would be able to, uh, with the right permitting, construct. In our case, it's not that simple. Indian Act, uh, first of all, you have to go to the designation process. That means you have to have a community vote uh, to give permission to designate the land so that then you, once you designate it, you can then go through uh, leasing. Uh, you have the, uh, the, the ability to lease uh, or sublease, I guess, uh, sublease uh, parts of that land so you can invite uh, commerce onto your property. Very difficult, very long. It took us three years just to get one building up on that land. Normally, you know, if, if we were doing fee simple, we would have been able to do that in probably a year and a half, you know. And we, would have, we wouldn't have had to beg, borrow, and, no, we didn't steal. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, make special deals with banks to finance, you know because you can't mortgage this land. You can't take it to the bank. The subleasing allowed us to take the sublease to the bank and that's what finally broke this open a, a little bit. But those problems are still there because the Indian Act is still, uh, still in existence. But it gives you an, ex an example what the impact is with, Indi with uh, Indian Act. It is, it is a piece of legislation that has uh, I don't know if it was intended to do to do it, but it certainly has. Uh, the consequences have been real, is that it has made us into uh, people who uh, are led to believe that we are totally dependent on others. We're totally dependent, so we have to wait for the check from Ottawa to to uh, to operate. You're shedding light on a story that happened here um, that I didn't understand at the time. Now you're, I, I bought the light of it. Uh, it was Steinhauer, the elder. Is it, was her name Rose? I can't remember. Um, it's Diane Steinhauer. Elma, Elma. Elma, Elma Steinhauer. So she was trying to talk to me about 
some of the issues and she said we need allies and she said you know I couldn't go get a mortgage I wanted to fix my house I can't get a mortgage and I didn't want to understand I, was, I did not know the backdrop to that I, I didn't understand what that meant yeah. So I get it. That's a piece of it, right? That's that's the, that's the piece of it uh, that uh, in the land question. Um, <clears throat> want me to say, I there want to is my house, and I want to get a, a mortgage to, to fix my house, and I can't do that because I don't have the freedom to do that. Yeah. 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 And so, um, if you want if you want to build a house on a reserve on, on at your own cost. Uh, two very important things come to the surface. One is not an investment. It can never be an investment. If you, if you build a house in Edmonton, you can view that as an investment, right? You can sell it, you can, you know, you get your money back, or you can get more money back, depending on the, on the market. Uh, reserve housing uh, can't operate that same way. Okay, uh, and the second thing, uh, the second thing is that uh, um, uh, uh, improvements, improvements to the home. You can do all the improvements you want. Uh, you'll never get your money back. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, uh, you're allowed to make improvements on the home. There are, there are very few restrictions around that, but. Because of that, uh, that uh, law that says that uh, we can't mortgage, then it, uh, uh, it really hampers the ability of families to improve their quality of life without sacrificing totally uh, their, their, uh, their livelihood. Uh, so, so that Indian Act is all-encompassing. It, uh, it, it deals with, uh, with housing. Um, at one point, uh, we, and in some, it, it still happens to, in some instances. Um, the, uh, if you passed away, uh, Indian Affairs took control of your estate. Okay, they took control of your estate, and the family had virtually no say on what happened. Okay. So it, it's caused problems in our communities because we're we're smart. We know what what we want to do with our stuff once we die, or what what's going to happen to it. Uh, sometimes it sometimes Indian Affairs has uh, has even ignored uh, directives on, on a state. Uh, 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 what call it uh, um, executing a state wishes so it, it, so it, it uh, it's very uh, it permeates into everything and it exp I think it exp once we know the the Sindinac story and understand and unpack it as Canadians uh, it explains a lot of a, a lot of why uh, why there's so much poverty why there is so much uh, identity property, uh, uh, poverty in our communities. <clears throat> it explains, you know, why uh, it is so difficult for us to get into the economy of this country. You know, uh, some, some, some of our leaders have been very uh, successful, but they've, They've uh, they've devoted their life to uh, to make that happen because of the so many uh, so many ways they have to skate around the the restrictions of the of the Indian Act. Go ahead. So what what would you say uh, removing the Indian Act? Like what are these barriers that are? One is education. Yeah. Obviously, we don't even know what it's about. That's right. The, the very first, the very first is education. Uh, uh, colonization has. Uh, what colonization does is it uh, it begins to lead people to believe in the untruth of uh, of who they are, and so. <clears throat> On the political side, I have heard 
First Nations leaders say, don't get rid of the Indian Act, we don't know what's going to replace it. <laughs> You know, and it's a it's a genuine fear. I mean, I uh, I have that fear. You know, well, what are we going to do? But then I I'm a little bit of an optimist. And I say, who cares? We'll figure it out. You know, because the other the other piece that uh, that Indian Affairs really works on us uh, as administrators of our communities is they you don't get anything wrong and they do it by the, the by the reporting regime they they uh, uh, they put us through if I if I acquire a grant from uh, from the federal government let's say uh, twenty thousand dollars to do a project well they will demand reports on that twenty thousand dollars always with and it leaves you thinking Boy, these guys think I'm dumb. You know, I'm incompetent. They don't trust me. That's the thinking, that's a colonized way of, of controlling people. It's like a bully. That's what a bully does to, uh, uh, to other people, is make them believe that, you know, they're not good, they're not good enough. And so, uh, that's number two. Okay, that's number two we have to deal with. Uh, <clears throat> a third is political will. Because we're not educated about the Indian Act, we don't say anything to our, uh, uh, our, our leaders. I'll give you an example of what I mean. <clears throat> um, do you remember uh, uh, Justin Trudeau um, went to uh, United Nations and he did a, a major presentation at the United Nations, you know, and he said, we've done a, very, we've done a really poor job of, in, in, in our relationship with indigenous people. And then he went on and he, he talked about uh, examples of that and, uh, and then he talked about, uh, he went from there to what do we do about it and he talked about nation to nation, re building, rebuilding a nation to nation relationship with indigenous populations, etc. So we got this great uh, message that's broadcast to the whole world and uh, and it lays out that Canada is not such a, is not such a hot place uh, health-wise in terms of relationship building. Uh, and, and I waited. What's, what is going to happen here? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I was really shocked. Indigenous people didn't jump on it, not in any way that I could sense as being uh, a, a, a moment to grab onto and to get mileage out of it. And the Canadian public just, is just kind of very silent, very, not much is being said. So, uh, but that was a moment I think that we could have really made mileage and say, look, you gotta get this thing out of here. Otherwise, that nation-to-nation -nation dream that you're talking about, the, uh, the new relationship that you're talking about, never going to happen. Never going to build a relationship on, on a piece of legislation that puts down a whole group of people and, and, and creates that bullying uh, uh, environment, you know, in, in the country. How difficult it is to change bureaucracy. You know, you've got 10,000 people housed in, uh, on 10 Wellington Street in Ottawa, and they're all, uh, they're all uh, triggered by the Indian Act. And you're gonna change that in one year? No, never happened. You have mentioned that there have been amendments made. Yes. So the possibility is there for amendments yes. at least, if not Am getting rid of Amendments, yeah. Um, <coughs> the one around land has been really, uh, uh, it's really tried 
to uh, improve the conditions by which uh, uh, opportunities can, can can occur. So there is a land uh, uh, management of land under a separate uh, a separate legislation. It's not under the Indian Act. Separate legislation, and so. Uh, uh, what uh, what First Nations leaders and uh, and the federal government have been able to do is is set that up so that it it breaks or it avoids many of the barriers that are uh, that are that exist under the Indian Act around the management uh, of land and its resources. So there are some improvements like that. Those are good. Uh, you know, moving in a good direction. Uh, in education, there's been some examples like the the Mi'kmaqs uh, of uh, New Brunswick and uh, Nova Scotia have been able to negotiate uh, longer term agreements with the federal government to manage education in their own territory. So it's it's it, it takes it away from uh, the micromanaging that. Uh, um, m many First Nations uh, have been experiencing around education. So there are some, there are some of those people inside of that system that understand. And if they can, if they can make a difference, some of them do. And that's that's the bright light. So it's not all it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, but uh, in the long run. The more you guys know about this, you know, the rest of Canada, the more you know about it in detail, the more likely it is that we're going to pressure um, our government to be more proactive in seeking out options that, uh, that are uh, uh, developmental and growth oriented and relationship building oriented than, uh, than we're experiencing right now. Go ahead. Could you say a little bit more about, like you said, you can build your own house or you can improve your own house, but you can't actually get benefit when you sell. Can you just say a little bit more about, like, why not? Why not? How, how does this yeah. work? Yeah, no, because nobody in my community would be able to afford to, because they have to go to the bank to buy from me. Okay. And they can't get more. Yeah, so if they don't have the cash in their pocket, then why, why, why buy? You know, you can't buy. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. In Alberta, we have 330 odd municipalities. So, to what you were speaking to before, if we're going to look to move forward together to find solutions, is there one page of information that you've come across or that we might be able to put together that would be a common page or a common starting point? You know. uh, yeah, I, that could be done. Um, my personal experience uh, around that kind of scenario is, uh, you know, is is actually doing it. Um, Saskatoon, we have Muskeg, uh, Muskeg Lake itself has a really strong working relationship with the city of Saskatoon. Uh, and the way, we, and that started back in the late 1980s when we were looking at purchasing land. But what we learned in that process is that you can't just approach this kind of a project strictly on a business uh, commercial mindset. You have to go in there with your Indian mindset and say, before we, before we learn to work together, we have to know each other. We have to go through the steps of knowing each other. So we spent, both the city and, and Muskeg have spent the last uh, 35 years uh, meeting regularly with each other and talking and, and, uh, and it's part of our annual agenda. So you got to work it. That's what I'm saying. You gotta, like any other, your marriage. You have to work at the marriage to make it work. You know, it's the same idea, same principle. Um, go ahead. What the, the agreement in Bing Lake for the housing? Um, there's 
it's not a formal agreement with the town of Blaine Lake, but we have a we have a, an agreement, a, a gentleman's agreement with the town of Blaine Lake, where they they have a lot, they have welcomed to a certain extent our uh, uh, we purchase lots and we put houses uh, on those lots and then we we have a rental regime, you know, to uh, uh, for anybody. It's not necessarily just for band members. Um, well, that's another example where uh, I don't know if we could do that in the town of Leask. You know, we don't have the same relationship with town of Leask and Glen Lake. We have a long relationship because our, many of our players played for the Le uh, Blen Lake Imperials many years ago. <laughs> and the old people remember that, you know. They still talk about it, you know, oh, he was a good player, you know, and, uh, and that builds that, that uh, sense of relationship. Uh, back in the 30s, uh, when, Indian, when the in, Indian agent was, uh, um, you know, kind of controlling the community and the activities of the community, uh, there are stories of uh, people from my community uh, transporting uh, picket, uh, picket uh, posts at three in the morning to avoid the uh, uh, the Indian agent, but the buyers were Blaine Lake people. You know, they, they were taking them to Blaine Lake or firewood, the same thing. So municipalities, uh, uh, it's a, I think that's an option worth exploring because it, it, it would make everybody stronger. Um, Right now we're working on a relationship with the Leask um, municipality. It all started because we discovered three years ago that they owned our road and we've been taking care of it for, for 40 years, you know. Beautiful road, we, the people say we have the best reserved road in, uh, in Saskatchewan. And we found out, oh, Leask, own, uh, Leask municipality owns this. And so we sent them a letter saying, oh, you owe us a pile of money. <laughs> <laughs> but it opened up the, the, the discussion, so now we came, we signed an agreement with the municipality, and they retain ownership, but they also have, uh, in that agreement, uh, um, mandated us to, uh, to take care of it, you know, and so we, that's our share in the, they normally do this through a tax base, and we don't we don't pay tax, and so our manpower is is uh, maintaining that that road. But uh, you know things like that can be worked out, and uh, and I know in the, in one of the meetings we talked about other areas of uh, of collaboration that can occur between uh, our municipality and uh, and the reserve. What it amounts to is small successes hopefully will lead to a larger. Exactly, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you do what you can to make, a, to make a change and it's usually a small thing that you do. But that small thing, it's like the seed, uh, the mustard seed idea. Uh, you all heard that story in the Bible. Same idea, <clears throat> one little thing, you experience success, it grows into something else, to other areas. And I think, in the long run, that is what is gonna make a difference on this Indian Act business, you know. Go ahead. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that the, under separate legislations there could be amendments to the Indian Act. Did, uh, is your ban signed into that? Yes. Actually, the, uh, we belong to the Saskatoon Tribal Council. All seven of the bands have signed on to that uh, to that uh, uh, agreement. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I got to witness this summer was I was up in Yellowknife and I went to the legislature, and it was beautiful to see kind of how it was set up in the circle, and they had pretty much equal representation of uh, elected officials. Um, what are they doing up there as far as how are they negotiating their rights and you know or what are they what are they uh, how are they being governed the Inuit at this uh, that's treaty 11 yeah um, <clears throat> 
The way the, the way the Treaty 11 people have handled historically their, uh, their identity, you know, as a people, was to do their, they got, uh, which is, what was that oblate? Uh, the old oblate has passed away. Fumilo. Fumilo. Oh, Fumilo, yeah. Fumilo, they got him to, uh, to document their history and their relationship to the land. A very comprehensive piece of work. Uh, well recognized and and so <clears throat> uh, that helped them to set the trend uh, in terms of uh, uh, of uh, building a different type of relationship to the Canadian government you know put them on a different footing and and they've been very uh, they've been, been very articulate and very uh, strong they've had strong leadership uh, working on the concept of sovereignty and uh, um, resources, uh, resource ownership and, and that. So um, it seems like uh, my sense, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not up there to, you know, but just looking in from the outside that um, uh, uh, they know where they want to go. And they're and they're willing to they're, they're patient and they're willing to work at it day in and day out you know to to get there. Uh, they have the advantage that they they have they have the numbers you know uh, to to influence their own local territorial government. Um, and and they've they've also had strong representation in Ottawa at different times. You know they've sent people to Ottawa that are very very uh, influential. So slightly different style, you know, that they've developed for themselves. But a lot of it, I think, is directly related to doing your homework. Get your you get yourself uh, solidly rooted in who you are, and then you can you can make a difference in your arguments. Being a newbie in the whole area, what is, where is Territory 11? Treaty 11? Yes, Treaty 11. Uh, Treaty, uh, Treaty 11 is in, our, in the straight north of here in the ter Northwest Territories. Uh, I, I don't know if it comes into uh, Alberta. It may have come into Alberta a little, but it's, mo it's mostly in the Northwest Territories, all the Dene, Dene people up there. Okay, why, Lucy? Oh, one, just one last, I, I wanted to say this before you started, but I'm going to say it now because it's been still sitting with me. Is, uh, what I'm noticing or observing in all of this is that um, you've always been referencing the, relation, the relational side to the more commercial side. Uh, and what I'm seeing is that there's a strong relationship with the maternal, you know, the, the both the women and men working together in, in indigenous uh, life and lifestyle, whereas the European way is far more paternalistic and patriarchal. Mm -hmm. And so we're still struggling to, to have that voice because I think you have the relational side because of your women, or at least a strong part of it, uh, because it, women tend to be relational. That, that's how we think, is relationship. I don't think your women's voices are being heard uh, as strongly um, I mean, we've come a long way, but we've not come a long way. <laughs> so um, it's, it's just a piece that I'm noticing in this whole conversation, so that when we say we need to reconnect and we need to, I think women know that and have always known that, but I'm not sure how we're being listened to in that um, conversation, that larger conversation. Uh, and, and once again, I, I think you, you have to, you have to, step backwards and, and do more uh, do more digging around to understand where we're coming from uh, and and you're right the, uh, uh, you go back to England and France the women were nothing they were properties of the men yeah. you know and, and there was very strong uh, a very large peasant population that had no virtually no rights, you know. So that's the, that's the historical backdrop. You come on this side and you, and you investigate the social organization of the Cree people, very quickly you see that the, um, 
the, the hierarchy is very, very slight, uh, and that the democratic system uh, of the Cree people is a very flat structure. It's it's actually more uh, more uh, a series of circles that uh, that uh, work together to uh, to create government uh, institutional uh, institutions maintenance of institutions creation of institutions etc. You can see it in the um, w uh, when you investigate the oral history of the uh, uh, of the treaties. You know how how much of that consultation was happening back in the teepees, you know, and it was more than, it, it was more than pillow talk, you know, it, it, it was, it was, um, societies and, uh, uh, and uh, organizations inside of that culture that had certain responsibilities and, and functions to inform Mr. Losses and the Taco Group on how to talk to the negotiating team. The women were in there. And, and today, in our communities, uh, much, to, uh, much to our uh, testosterone, uh, what do you call them? Uh, it's the women who have come through the healing way ahead of the men. And you go to many of our communities, the administration is, is, is women, women. And they tell the chief how to, what to say. <laughs> back, just back in the old days. <laughs> and it's more than pillow talk. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it's, it, it's, uh, some of that demo democratic system is, has remained and some of it is being reconstructed. So I think there's hope there that uh, things like uh, the missing and murdered women, whole mo that whole movement, I think uh, uh, can be, uh, can be um, impacted by recognizing you know, what, uh, what already exists in our communities you know, in terms of uh, attitude toward women. Kiwai. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you started this section by saying that the Indian Act is completely contrary to the treaties. How can they exist together in law? And can you sort of say, well, this is what the treaty says, this is what we're going to do? Um, it's not, be not because we haven't tried. <laughs> no, honestly. Well, which takes precedence? And, and is it the your bureaucracy, precedence? your bureaucracy is oriented and trained to think Indian Act, and all everything happens, everything is vetted through the bureaucracy, and so it's very difficult for change to occur. It's only when, in a case like uh, like the Mi'kmaq, they they were able to take education out and say, okay, this is the way we want it. And we can, we, we can only have this if you pass another act in parliament that recognizes this new way. And Indian Act is way over here. That's the only way. So you can't, you can't say what it says so, in the treaty. That's right. So you got a piece. I think, uh, I think there is no comprehensive stripping away of the Indian Act. It's got to be done in p bits and pieces like that. Yeah. You've got to make it obsolete over, you know, as many areas as possible. Egwa. I just want to say uh, I'm a Blackfoot, uh -huh. born and raised on the Blood Reserve. But when I got married, I married a Cree at Enoch. I was stripped off my, my rights on the Blood Reserve and I became a Treaty Indian, a, a, a Cree Indian woman. Like I had no say. Yeah. That's just the way it was. But I see a little bit of change, like for chief and council. In my time, it was always men that were the chief and council, always. That, there was no women or nothing. But in the last few years, at Enoch, uh, there's ten, one chief and ten, uh, nine councillors. Three of them are women. 
So there is yeah. a little, little change. And, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I welcome that. Mm -hmm. And the three women that are sitting there, they're educated. They've went to school. They have a bachelor's degree or a university degree. Our chief has a, a university degree. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's changing a, a little bit. But I yeah. agree with a lot of what you've been presented. Yeah. How yeah. the treaties were uh, very yeah. unfair, and it's true about the homes. We can't sell our homes. We have to stay in that home forever and ever. Yeah. You know, so it's uh, it, it, it's yeah. And, and, and I think on the outside don't see that yeah. what's happening in the reserve. Yeah. You know, and we don't go out telling people this is you know what's happening, this is what happens. But hopefully someday that will change. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay, I, I just want to uh, uh, add on to what she's adding here uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, um, the Indian Act and it's true what she's saying, it's true. For many years it was all men. Men were the chiefs, men were the counselors, men were the headmen. But remember, it's the Indian Act that's got a whole section on elections, and it has at times forced First Nations to give up their form of uh, government uh, uh, establishment processes in favor of elections that have caused nothing but problems in their communities as, as it's been and because of I think I'm guessing but I think I'm it's a good guess uh, uh, we were raised in the residential school to think uh, about women in that in that way that the father superior was the was the ran the residential school and so we we were in, trained to think that it had to be a man to be you know and that the women were incapable of uh, leadership and now we're seeing the light